Hello and good afternoon. My name is Clinton Bench and I'm the Director of Fleet and Transit at UCLA Events and Transportation. And first off, I'd like to welcome everyone who's taken an hour out of their day this afternoon to join us for this fall ramp up info session, but also thank you for all of the work that you've done over the course of this COVID-19 pandemic to ensure that UCLA can continue to meet its core mission of education, research, and service. Next, I'll take a moment to introduce some of our subject matter experts who are here today to answer your questions about all ramp up. We have Chad Bascom from Facilities Management who can answer questions regarding building ventilation. Sarah Dundish from Housing and Hospitality who can answer questions about all things on the Hill. Adrian Malka from Insurance and Risk Management who's handling requests for exceptions regarding our UC vaccination requirement. Diego DeHaro from Events and Transportation who can answer questions regarding commute planning. Kathleen Sharoma from Campus HR who can answer questions about flex work and other HR issues. Todd Weber is here from IT Services and can provide advice and suggestions regarding technology to help us work more productively in this new world of flex work and hybrid meetings. Lizette Martinez is here from Facilities Management also. She can answer questions regarding requests for supplies, materials, and also custodial and ground services. We're happy to have Dr. Peter Katona as well. He's from the Dave Geffen School of Medicine and also our Fielding School of Public Health. And he chairs our infection control working group of the COVID Response and Recovery Task Force. And he can certainly help us answer questions about the best ways to reduce the risk of spread of the COVID-19 virus. And finally, Michelle Sitchar is here from Environmental Health and Safety and can advise us on policy and compliance issues. So just a brief introduction about what will come next. Uh, I will do a brief presentation on key issues uh, for ramp up planning, um, as well as risk reduction protocols. And then we will jump immediately into uh, our question and answer session. We do have over 100 questions that have already come in in advance of this meeting, so we'll spend a good bit of time answering those questions first, but we will make sure to have a little bit of time as well to answer some of the questions that are coming through live on the webinar. And just a reassurance that if we're not able to get to all of those questions, and I suspect we won't, um, we will make sure uh, to provide answers to those questions on the COVID-19 uh, website over the next week or so. I encourage you to make sure that you're using the question and answer function here on the webinar uh, to submit your questions and also to view responses that may be provided in writing. Uh, we also interesting to see what your colleagues are asking as well. So here's a brief summary of the topics that we expect to discuss today. As I said before, this is a session on ramp up planning. So our primary audience for today's session are departmental administrators, building coordinators, other supervisors and managers who are responsible for or involved in filling out departmental ramp up forms. So uh, we'll have an opportunity to answer questions about filling out those forms, but also specific questions about some of the items you see here on the screen. I won't read through all of them, but uh, was certainly able to provide advice on flex work planning. Um, new equipment you might need um, in this uh, different working environment and other operational planning issues as well. Now, there are some questions that really are going to best be answered personally. Um, for example, questions about individual health circumstances. Uh, and requests for responses about what may happen in individual cases of non-compliance really do need to be made directly uh, to HR. Um, also, departments are responsible for making decisions about how flex work will be implemented um, in their area. So we're not able to answer questions about 
why a particular decision was made in a certain department. And of course, we understand that not everyone will agree with every policy that's been put in place by UC or on our campus, but today's forum is really more about implementing those policies and finding the most successful ways to do them. So now that we've defined the framework for today's discussion, I just want to take a quick step back to talk a little bit about how we got to where we are today. You know, initially at the beginning of the pandemic, the Emergency Operations Center was the first to respond. And their focus was on preserving essential services in a time of substantial uncertainty. New safety protocols were put in place for on-campus work and considerable work was done as well in making sure that those who were working from home, working remotely could do so successfully. And later in 2020, the COVID Response and Recovery Task Force was set up both to plan for our eventual return to campus and also to make sure that we were responding properly to changing conditions with infection rates, development of vaccines and other factors. Uh, and this COVID Response and Recovery Task Force was actually designed to have 12 working groups uh, that developed recommendations uh, over the course of the past year on how to maintain our high standards for teaching, housing, and other campus functions. Now, the COVID Response and Recovery Task Force has been ramping down over the course of the last couple of months, and the focus has really shifted into departmental ramp up. Uh, it's important to note that as departments develop their own ramp up plans, one size will not fit all. It's important for each individual department to take responsibility for developing their own ramp up plans for the fall. And there's plenty of guidance available from multiple online resources, which I'll share in a moment, but decisions about flex work changes, changes in service uh, provision, um, and how operations may be different um, in this COVID recovery environment really will need to be made at the department level. Now, it's my hope that most of you are aware of the UCLA Campus Ramp Up Planning Guide, which is available on the covid19.ucla.edu website. And on that planning guide is a very helpful 10 point ramp up planning checklist. I won't list each of those 10 items here, but among the top priorities in the checklist are making sure that you know in advance which employees may be on flex work plans, how to reduce employee density um, on campus. Also planning for changing equipment needs and assessing building ventilation, making sure that community members are wearing masks indoors and keeping our facilities clean. Finally, making sure that staff have um, adequately prepared for their commutes back to campus. So the campus ramp up guide then also includes a campus ramp up form, which is intended to serve as a template for departmental administrators, building coordinators, managers and supervisors, and others to ensure that key provisions for a successful return to campus are being met. Uh, Generally, these ramp up forms uh, were set to be due about six weeks before a department's return to in person work. And since we are so close to the beginning of the fall quarter, we're at that point where the deadline is effectively as soon as possible. So I hope that in today's session, you'll get additional information that you need to fill out those plans or those uh, forms. And just to note, these forms are not going to receive some sort of official stamp of approval. That said, these forms will be reviewed by members of the COVID response and recovery team. And also it's incredibly important for departments who are providing support services to yours to be able to see what your plans are. For example, events and transportation is interested in knowing what the demand for parking will be after we return to campus. Facilities management will need to know when you're planning on returning to your offices and other facilities in order to know when to restart custodial services. IT is interested in knowing about whether or not there are any new requirements for 
technology to support a flexible work environment. And there are many other examples as well. So please do take the time to fill out your ramp up form and receive comments from a member of the team if necessary. And finally, I won't spend much time here because our focus is really on more of the nuts and bolts of ramp up planning. But it is important to remind everyone that vaccinations are required of all employees and students. And you're considered fully vaccinated 14 days after the final dose. There are limited exceptions for medical and strongly held religious beliefs. Those who wish to make requests for exceptions need to do th so through the symptom monitoring app. Now, of course, those who have been on campus at least once per week already know about the symptom monitoring app, which can be accessed on a mobile device or on your computer. And it's required to be filled out every day that you are going to be on campus, if even for a short time. We also are requiring testing once per week for all who work learn or live on the UCLA campus or in UCLA facilities. And finally, masks still are required indoors. And there are very limited exceptions, of course, while you're actively eating or drinking, or perhaps when you're alone in your office uh, with the door closed. So we're just about ready to jump into our questions and answers on the screen here. Uh, are a few examples of key resources that can be helpful to you in, the, in completing your ramp up plan and also your ramp up form. Uh, we will be copying each of these uh, links into the chat so that you could cut and paste them for yourself. And also we're identifying here a few key contacts if you have additional questions. So now for the question and answer. All right, so again, I'm excited to have you all here. Um, quite a few participants today, um, and we'll do our best to answer all the questions that we can. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Marisol, um, who is going to be reading a number of our uh, questions um, and uh, asking the panelists for their answers. Some of them I'll answer, but I'm going to try and uh, let the experts handle most of them. So Marisol, do you want to jump in with the first one? Okay, we need to unmute. <laughs> there we go. I apologize. Thank you, Clinton. Uh, so for the first question, it will be addressing for it will be for Adrian. For employees seeking vaccine exemptions, what is the timeline for UCLA to tell them if the exemption is approved? If an employee seeks an exception and the exemption is not approved, what should departments do? either in the time period while the person is getting a vaccine or if the person refuses to take the vaccine. Hi, thank you. Glad to be here to address everyone. Let me answer this in a couple of sections. The first one regarding the timeline for um, knowing when the exception is approved. So um, the university has contracted with a third party administrator um, to um, process all of our exception requests. And the name of that company is Sedgwick. A university has had a 30 year relationship with Sedgwick. Um, so Sedgwick is processing all exception requests for UCLA. And um, these requests were on hold early on, uh, pending some policy guidance from uh, UCLP legal. Uh, so they just began processing about two weeks ago and determinations should be coming out uh, shortly. Uh, new requests are acknowledged uh, within 24 hours. And when you send in, when you do your submission through the symptom survey, you should get some kind of response from Sedgwick within 24 hours that includes forms that um, the employee would then need to submit. Um, Sedgwick has indicated that catching up on those early requests will be completed soon and staying on top of new requests in real time the turnaround will be pretty fast depending on how fast each employee submits the required documentation. Um, so then the question about 
um, when an employee is seeking an exemption and the exemption is not approved, what should departments do either in the time period while the person is getting a vaccine? So when an exception request is denied, um, there is a well-defined timeline in the policy, the COVID vaccine policy in Appendix F, which begins on page 27. So everything is spelled out there for anyone who wants to look at it. So I really encourage you to look at the policy. Basically, the employee has 14 days uh, to submit proof of their first shot. Uh, during the period until full vaccination, the employee can remain on campus, but they have to, they have to comply with all of the non-pharmaceutical interventions, which are the safety measures, like wearing a mask and symptoms monitoring survey and weekly testing. So what if the person refuses to take a vaccine? Um, employees will be provided with notice of their non-compliance and given opportunities to come into compliance. Um, again, the policy is, is, provides all this information in Appendix F um, and, at, and the very last page of the policy, there's a flow chart that tells you exactly uh, the days and times and, and what happens. So please take a look at the, pro at the policy. Um, and at the end of the day, non-compliance eventually leads to the discipline process, which follows policy and the collective bargaining agreements. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, the next question for you is, we have several key members of our department who are not vaccinated. If they don't get an exception, what flexibility will we have to make other arrangements for them? Well, all covered individuals must be vaccinated or have an approved exception to access university owned or leased property. Uh, if an employee is working 100% remotely, they need not request an exception. But that means that that person, that employee would never, ever, never come to campus, come to a location. Non-compliant com employees are subject to discipline, and there's, there's no flexibility for allowing non-compliant employees to come to a, a UC location or for the department to ignore the policy. Uh, we can't hear you. The next question I have for you is for student staff working in various departments, would their supervisor know if they applied for a vaccine exception? Oh, that's a good question. Um, if this is something that we're working on addressing, uh, students are using the student portal to provide um, vaccination status and request exceptions and ASH uh, student health is processing those exception requests. Um, ASH data is uploaded to the portal and effective September 9th, the supervisor clearance portal will combine um, for student employees and for regular staff, um, the two factors, meaning policy compliance and symptom survey. So cleared means that both factors are met, that the, the person is compliant. Uh, not cleared means that one of those factors hasn't been met. So supervisors will know um, whether an employee is cleared uh, for, as, with the student staff, student employees and, and staff. Great, thank you, Adrian. Um, my next question is for Clinton. For the purpose of the ramp up form, who counts as a staff member? That's actually a great question too. And I know it's at, this question has been asked in a couple of different ways. So let me do my best to, to answer it. Um, first off, let me take a step back and remind folks that with respect to these ramp up forms, they are primarily meant for, for two, two things. One is for the person and the department that's filling it out um, to sort of have a framework for making sure that they're hitting on all those key points that are gonna help them have a successful return. But the other thing is to make sure that supporting departments like facilities, IT, uh, events and transportation, et cetera, can uh, plan well uh, to support those other units. So keeping that in mind, it's not meant to, um, we're, we're not taking this information into a database and doing some you know, uh, robust calculations with it. Um, so go ahead and include all of the employees that you do have 
Um, and if say, for example, um, your department uh, has was just 10 full-time employees and 10 part-time employees, it's okay to say that there are um, 20 employees, mm -hmm. or if you want to think of it um, as full-time equivalents, you could you know, make a comment about that. Um, and just let us know then what the percentage of people um, are expected to be on each uh, different working day. And that'll give us a good sense of parking demand, uh, custodial demand, IT demand, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Clinton. My next question is for Chad. Um, and this is a big one. Is the air in my building safe? So over the last 18 months or so, uh, facilities management has worked closely with eh &S, and we have evaluated all, all of the buildings here on the core campus um, to make sure that they meet CDC and ASHRAE minimum ventilation standards with MERV 14 filters and outside air. Um, today, we have found that 94% of the campus has already, already met the minimum standards set by CDC and ASHRAE. The remaining 6% of the campus rooms and areas and buildings that don't meet are being delivered HEPA filtration systems through eh &S. And that can be uh, building ventilation assessments can be requested at uh, the building ventilation assessment website, which is also found on the top of the ramp up guide. Thank you, Chad. All right, the next question I have is for Diego and this has to do uh, with parking. What steps or accommodations will UCLA make for employees whose commutes to campus have been severely impacted by COVID-19 related closures or alterations of public transit routes to campus? Everyone, so space is extremely limited uh, on campus as we all know. Um, although we highly recommend using sustainable transportation options, we understand that it's not uh, always um, viable for everyone. Uh, to park in UCA facilities, UCLA transportation offers drivers uh, parking permit options. Uh, faculty and staff may reach out to the department commute coordinators for more information on permit eligibility and, and availability and pay via pay reduction, uh, while students may purchase or apply um, for a parking permit each quarter. Thank you, Diego. Um, this question, the next question I have is for facilities management, Lisette. Where can I order appropriate masks, hand sanitizers, and other supplies? Um, disinfectant supplies can be ordered through our FSR um, service request. So visit fsr.ucla.edu to submit that request. Um, we ask that when you submit an FSR to please um, include COVID in the FAU project description to help the campus track the services being requested for this. And individual pricing for items in those COVID kits can be found at facilities.ucla.edu forward slash COVID-19. Um, pricing is subject to change, and once the kits have been prepared, um, campus community members are being asked to pick them up from our facilities management building by setting up appointments. Thank you, Lisette. The next question I have is an HR-related question, so this one goes to Kathleen. I'm a supervisor, and I'm an employee in my office notified me that they tested positive. As a supervisor, whom do I notify? So supervisors, or if any employee tests positive um, and an employee voluntarily discloses this to the supervisor, an email should be sent to the COVID call center. And if the staff or faculty member was exposed or infected in the course of work-related duties, um, the person should be directed, the, the person who tested positive should be directed to call uh, the UCLA COVID call center, which will provide an assessment. Um, so if the call center is closed, the person who tested positive should be directed to not report to work um, or to campus until they have received clearance from the COVID call center to do so. 
So there are other st steps that need to be taken as well. So I recommend reviewing the standard operating procedure um, for uh, the COVID, uh, under the COVID prevention testing and treatment link. Thank you, Kathleen. For our next question, uh, this one goes to EHNS, Michelle. Can I eat at my desk? Thanks for giving me the easy one, Marisol. <laughs> uh, yes, you can eat at your desk. LA County Department of Public Health does make an exception to the universal indoor masking requirement when you're eating or drinking. Um, however, if you need to get up to use the bathroom or go to the kitchen for any reason, then you do have to put your mask back on. Um, and I also want to point out that since it is a workplace, there are also stipulations under the Cal OSHA emergency temporary standard. So if that is the case, those conditions will also apply and we need to comply with those. Um, and then I just wanted to follow up quickly on the question that was asked to Lizette about COVID supplies. Um, we also have face masks available through the UCLA emergency PPE store that's managed through EHNS. Uh, these face masks will be made available free of charge to employees who are unable uh, to obtain their own. And we also provide N95s for unvaccinated employees upon uh, request. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate it. Next question is uh, for Dr. Katona. Do you anticipate any changes due to the rising number of COVID cases due to the Delta variant? That's a difficult question to answer. I try not to make predictions beyond a couple of weeks. And if you have followed the outbreak, most everybody who's made predictions has been wrong. But having said that, it will depend on a number of variables. It'll depend on the variant and what the variant does, the Delta variant. It'll depend on the vaccine and how effective it is and how much waning immunity there is. It's going to affect how much masking we adhere to under the right appropriate circumstances, uh, particularly indoors. It will depend on good basic public health directives and whether we adhere to them. And in the end, you know, there may be just a chance mutation that may alter things in a way that we didn't anticipate. And remember, because a mutation may cause a more transmissible variant to occur, it doesn't mean it has a greater survivability. So it's both things that have to be taken into account. Because of all these factors, it's going to be very hard to give you a prediction. Thank you so much, Dr. Katona. All right, uh, the next question is um, IT related, and this one is for Todd. I am concerned that my office may not be ready for high volume in-person drop-in meetings. What software options can we use to offer the same level of service and cut down on the number of in-person interactions? That's a great question. So, you know, as more employees are returning to in-person work, meetings will most likely, you know, need to be held in a hybrid format. Uh, some participants may utilize a conference room together while others are going to participate via video conferencing. So as such, departmental administrators and your IT teams should ensure that your conference rooms are set up to allow meaningful participation for all of your attendees. Uh, for example, video cameras should be positioned in a way that show all of the participants in the room and microphones should be adequate to pick up all the voices within the same room. Um, we can and will provide a link to an IT services website that provides a lot more detailed information on our campus-wide audiovisual recommendations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Todd. All right, the next question I have is for Clinton. I heard about the furniture allowance. When will that be made available? Is that retroactive? Uh, the answer to the first question is I very much hope that um, it will be available within the next uh, few business days. I know there are a lot of folks that are anxious uh, to be able to place those orders and I'm confident that you will be able to very soon. Uh, there were some technical issues that we were working out, um, but uh, I think they're pretty much solved. So please watch, watch for a Bruin post soon in an inbox near you. Um, with respect to uh, the retroactivity, uh, yes, there will be some uh, 
retroactivity in the sense that if an employee had purchased uh, a chair or a desk that is considered to meet our ergonomic standards, um, there is the opportunity uh, for reimbursement and there, and there will be information on that in the Bruin Post that's coming out. And just as a reminder to those who may not be familiar with the question in the first place, uh, ca the campus will be centrally funding uh, a chair and a height adjustable desk for employees who are on flex work plans that have them working three or more days a week out of the office in the long term. And uh, I can also tell you that the website to order them on um, will be pretty easy to use and that delivery and installation will be included in that centrally funded price. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Clinton. All right, so my next question is for Chad and this has to do with HVAC again. My building does not meet standards. Where can I get an assessment? And what about air purifiers? Um, so kind of similar to, to question one, we have the building ventilation assessment website online. Uh, it could be found on the ramp up guide on the top of the ramp up guide. You can on that website, it has a list of buildings that either the entire building or a specific area or room in that building does not meet the ASHRAE ventilation okay. standards. You can then go through the process, select your building, select your floor, select your room number, and it will tell you if you need an HVAC assessment done. If it does, you can click the next button. It'll generate a work order for facilities management, or we will then evaluate the HVAC in that area and determine if it needs a uh, portable air purifier or it does meet the ASHRAE HVAC standards. All right, thank you so much, Chad. My next question is for parking again. So this is for Diego. Will any consideration be given to employees whose commute to campus uses public transportation but who do not feel safe to ride on public transportation, given the number of other riders who do not wear masks properly. Yes, yeah, so um, public transportation services in the region are all following CDC guidelines to reduce um, reduction. And there have been no known cases of COVID transmissions from public transportation, however, uh, employees are eligible to purchase daily or monthly parking through the Bruin uh, e permit portal if they feel safer to do so. And I just let, let me jump in as well. Um, in, in my other hat as director of fleet and transit for UCLA, just to clarify on Diego's uh, answer there, there have certainly been cases um, uh, from public transportation, just like in any other um, you know type of facility. Um, in the world. But what we have been able to confirm is that there are no known large clusters um, that are originating uh, from uh, public transportation. So we still uh, do offer those uh, reduced rate monthly passes for public transportation. You can buy them online at uh, transportation.ucla.edu. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Clinton. As somebody who hasn't owned a car in about 13 years and commutes to campus on the bus every day, I really appreciate that answer. <laughs> All right, for our next question, uh, it's for facilities management, Lisette. Who pays for appropriate masks, hand sanitizer, and other supplies? Uh, facilities management has installed and is maintaining a number of hand sanitizing stations throughout campus and it's planning to provide custodial services to high traffic areas um, with more frequency. However, individual departments are responsible for purchasing necessary personal protective equipment and supplies. Okay, all right, thank you so much, Lisette. My next question is for HR, so Kathleen again. 
who approves the flex work agreements? Are they just turned into supervisors? So employees, so a flex work agreement is sort of the end stage of, you know, once a flex work arrangement has been approved, right? Um, the employee would sign, would, would, would sign it, the department head would sign it. Um, each organization has to make its own determinations as to what level of supervisor or manager is going to sign um, the flex work agreement. Um, many department heads are having these conversations with their employees now. Um, employees can submit a flexwork proposal. There is a form that's linked in the flexwork guide um, if they would like to, to request to be able to either work remotely or have an alternate work schedule. Um, and the department should take that into consideration. But each department will have its own process. Some departments may um, request that employees submit it to their supervisor, um, and then it will go to the department head from there, or possibly the organization head. So, so you should check with your local HR to see um, what the process is for your specific organization. All right, thank you, Kathleen. Uh, our next question is for Michelle, it's an EHNS question. What are departments required to provide to employees? Some examples, but not limited to. Masks, gloves, cleaning supplies, partitions for high contact areas like the front desk, student affairs, places like that. What are we required to provide to employees? Uh, well, we're required to provide a safe work environment that existed before COVID and exists now. Um, there are specific provisions under the Cal OSHA Emergency Temporary Standard, which does stipulate employers to provide face masks to employees, which I spoke about a few minutes ago, and also to provide respirators to unvaccinated employees who request one. Uh, and I've also mentioned we do have that process in place at UCLA. We address this through our emergency PPE store where employees can request that um, material. Uh, we also have the vaccine exception request through Adrian's area, which we coordinate with in order to provide these um, masks to our employees. Uh, but on a broader scale, we are also required to continue performing thorough cleaning of high touch surfaces, common areas, et cetera. Uh, and we also have to conduct more stringent disinfection of spaces that were occupied by a COVID positive individual. So all of that is done through facilities management and also our folks up in housing. Uh, we also have to do, or we didn't have to do, but we did do a building, um, a campus wide building ventilation assessment which was spoken about just a few minutes ago as well. That was done with um, facilities management and EHS and providing portable air uh, purifying units to areas where warranted. We need to make sure we screen our employees for symptoms. So that has been deployed at UCLA early on uh, during the pandemic for, and we also have um, access to testing both for diagnostic and surveillance purposes. Uh, there's so much that we provide and I can go on and on, but I will just leave you with this, that there is a UCLA COVID-19 prevention program that is in place that is posted on the main COVID-19 return to campus website, along with all the other protocols that remain in effect for testing, um, you know, what else is there, contact tracing, everything else. Um, and then to the last part of that question, um, I think it was about partitions. Um, the requirements for solid partitions under LA County actually retired, uh, I think in July. Um, so along with other mitigations that were lifted when the state reopened in June. So apart from very narrow conditions involving perhaps a workplace outbreak, barriers are not generally required. And there is a guidance under LA County if you guys are interested in reading that. Okay, great. Thank you, Michelle. And talking about um, partitions, uh, this is for Dr. Katona. How effective are acrylic or plexiglass partitions in preventing the spread of COVID-19? Would you recommend partitions in a cubicle setting? Well, as far as I know, there are no head-to-head -head studies looking at partitions or looking at shields to see exactly how effective they are. It looks like they might have some effect, but it's very, very difficult to measure. It really kind of boils down to what kind of respiratory transmission there is, which we break down into droplet part particles, which are generally large particles of five to microns or bigger, 
than the aerosol particles, which are much smaller. Um, aerosol seems to get around the room very easily, no matter what partitions you have. And there's some effect on, on stopping the droplet partitions by having some kind of a shield between you and the person who breathes or coughs that's near you. But I think more important is, um, is understanding that the ventilation of the room is probably more important. And that involves the air exchanges per hour, the filtration of the air, the size of the room, the number of people in the room, the duration that somebody's gonna be in the room. I think these are more, much more important than the actual partition itself made of plexiglass. Thank you, Dr. Katona. Uh, our next question has to do again with technology. So this one's for Todd. In addition to software, where can we find any recommended equipment and where can we purchase it? So I can offer some general recommendations. We're recommending a device called the Meeting Owl Pro for small conference rooms, collaboration, and huddle spaces. Uh, the Meeting Owl Pro is you know, very portable, allows you to move the device quickly between rooms. For larger spaces, we're recommending technology from D10, which comes in a 55 and 75 inch uh, display model, which are mounted on a wall. The D10 is a room zoom, uh, a zoom room, excuse me, hardware with built-in cameras and microphones, uses the familiar zoom interface as, and is incredibly user-friendly. Um, you can also take the 55 inch and mount it on a mobile car and move it between rooms, classrooms, conference spaces at will. Um, of course, I would always recommend that you know everyone consult with their AT, their IT and AV teams, or review the AV recommendations on the IT services website. Great, thank you so much, Todd. Mm -hmm. uh, my next question is for Clinton. Is there an effort to address building density for administrative buildings that have multiple different departments? If so, how are department heads advised of this? Yeah, this has come up a couple of times. And yeah, it's challenging in some buildings where there's um, a number of different departments and they may have uh, different requirements for uh, on-campus work. So one of, the th one of the ways that we're planning on addressing this is again, uh, by looking at the submittals from the campus ramp up forms. If we do find uh, that a particular building seems to have um, a, a higher percentage of staff uh, working on site um, than, uh, than others, we can reach out to the department heads in that building just to make sure uh, that appropriate precautions are being taken um, and also ask if they need any assistance um, in being able to uh, consider flex work uh, possibilities for their employees. Uh, the, I will sort of close on this answer, though, by saying that uh, we're working very hard as a campus uh, to make sure that we're prepared for various eventualities. And it's always, you know, the, the most important things that we can continue to do are you know, getting vaccinated and uh, following protocols of wearing masks and, uh, you know, keeping one another safe. So uh, thank you for that question. We will uh, be careful to watch those ramp up forms and see whether some potential um, trouble spots might be um, coming up. Great, thank you, Clinton. My next question is actually for facilities management uh, for Lizette. We wanna make people aware of masking safety guidelines. Where can I find the signage? Approved concurrent signage is available for download on our facilities management website, facilities.utah.edu forward slash COVID-19 forward slash signage. Um, currently, facilities management and housing and hospitality services are posting signage uh, about protocols at the entrance to most buildings. The signage should not be removed or replaced. However, directions on placing additional signage in buildings will be distributed soon and will be the responsibility of departments and building coordinators. For example, signage regarding masking requirements will need to be placed in conference rooms and other protocol reminders should be posted in hallways. 
Individual departments are encouraged to use standardized and approved campus signage in all cases except for instruction about specialized functions. And additional resources for signage and functions are available on the LA County Department of Public Health, and that link will be posted. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate it. My next question is actually for Michelle. Um, are there event policies for departmental events, about 30 to 60 guests, both indoors and outdoors for the fall? It seems that smaller events like this don't have much guidance at the moment. That is a great question. Um, as most of you know, we did, uh, we, we stopped doing event reviews and approvals through EHNS in June when we reopened to the general public. So apart from large events and mega events that involve thousands of attendees, uh, the review and approval process uh, was generally lifted. Um, but in general, all attendees who do come to our campus events do have to adhere to non-pharmaceutical interventions such as masking, uh, symptom monitoring, and all other mitigations outlined in our summary document, which is posted to the Return to Campus website. Uh, and there's also, for large events, there's also uh, an LA County Department of Public Health guidance uh, that we follow. Um, and I will say that I know this is, there's some level of complexity when external guests are invited to attend our campus events since they're not subject to our UC vaccine policy. Um, and there's also instances where it's not practical for those attendees to complete our symptom survey for non-affiliates, even though that exists as an option. Um, so in those situations, we generally follow um, LA County's recommendation to have attendees present uh, proof of vaccination record, although we don't collect or store them, uh, or proof of negative tests within 72 hours of the event. Um, it's really situational when it comes to these events. I actually responded to one in the chat as well. Um, so if your department needs help, please send an email to COVID-19 um, at UCLA.edu for assistance, and we'll uh, walk you through it. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, my next question is for Kathleen. It's an HR related question. A lot of people are still processing the psychological trauma of the past 16 months. Is anyone planning a campus wide mental health approach to help managers lead within the context of real fears and anxieties members of our staff are conveying to us? So um, there are many resources that are currently available um, on the UCLA COVID-19 site. There's a link to emotional, social, and physical well-being. Um, you know, there is, we always recommend for staff and faculty, the Staff and Faculty Counseling Center, um, which is um, um, available to do Zoom, you know, sessions and, and um, assist people who are struggling. Um, and there is the Semmel Healthy Campus Initiative Center, um, which has a COVID-19 well-being page and, a, and they also have a Live Well podcast. Um, there's uh, Stand Together during COVID-19, is, which is part of the UCLA Depression Grand Challenge, um, has tools, resources, and strategies designed to help community, community members um, who are experiencing anxiety. So there are a lot of resources available. I, I, I recommend that um, supervisors and managers, you know, review the information on the COVID-19 page and direct staff members to, to it who are struggling. Uh, thank you, Kathleen. Uh, at the moment, we are gonna switch to some of the questions that we have been receiving live. Uh, so this one that we received was, can you please speak to the test tube issues with the spit tests. Many people are getting responses that their tests were unreadable despite following the directions. Thank you. I will take that one. <laughs> um, so the just to uh, clarify for some that may not have been on campus yet, uh, we do have a new protocol for self-testing um, on a weekly basis, at least one time a week for um, on-campus employees and UCLA Health is doing uh, uh, two times a week. Uh, we have vending machines all over campus, so it makes it very easy to swipe your brewing card and, and grab a kit. Um, and the new test is done via saliva. Uh, and then the 
sample is placed into a box and the, uh, the user who is uh, putting, in that, putting in that sample needs to confirm um, that they're depositing that sample uh, through um, the use of QR codes and uh, barcodes on the kits. The instructions are inside the kit, so they're very easy. And if uh, you haven't done it yet, so don't worry too much. It's very quick and certainly painless. Um, if not, everybody's favorite thing to do. <laughs> um, but we have had, um, uh, we have heard that there are a number of people who have had trouble scanning the barcodes on the actual tube, which is part of the process you use to uh, validate uh, that you've done the test and that you're putting it in the box and associate that sample with you. Uh, what we've been able to do is change the uh, software uh, that's being used so that smartphones have an easier time reading those barcodes. So it's my understanding that over the course of the last week, uh, we have not had anywhere near as many issues and I hope that continues as well. Um, also, um, I do just wanna note that there was um, a couple of weeks ago, um, a time when uh, there were more unreadable tests uh, than usable, usual. And that issue has been fixed as well. And we do not expect there to be um, any further clusters of um, tests that, that come back unreadable. So um, we do also hope that uh, uh, we can continue to provide those test responses quickly and uh, we're doing our best to do so. So thank you to everybody for being careful to follow the instructions on your kits and scan those barcodes uh, to make sure that your uh, sample is associated with you. Thank you, Clinton. Uh, this next live one that we received, uh, this one looks like it's appropriate for Michelle. What is the guidance for in-person meetings? Any guidelines on the maximum number of people recommended? I've gotten this question a lot, actually. Um, there are no restrictions on in-person meetings anymore. Uh, that was lifted when everything else was lifted in June. Um, everyone participating, I, I will reemphasize again and again, uh, do, do have to comply with all of our required mitigations on campus, symptom screening, uh, surveillance testing, masking, all of the above. Um, so just making sure that they're all in compliance with those uh, requirements, the in-person meetings can uh, proceed. Oh, great. Uh, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, the next one that I received for live uh, is actually for Clinton again. Uh, it stated in the previous meeting that we had on Monday, it sounded like the ramp up forms were to be used only within each department. The website indicates it will need to be submitted more broadly, which is correct. Thank you. So again, I did, I did um, post the link uh, to the campus ramp up uh, uh, planning guide. And in that ramp up planning guide, uh, we have the campus ramp up form. So I just wanna draw folks attention in the chat um, to the link that was posted there. Um, and with respect to how to fill that out, uh, the, I'll go back to my earlier answer, and it's sort of a one size that doesn't necessarily fit all. Again, these um, forms are meant to be a framework for the department to use to make sure that they're hitting all of the high points uh, to make sure they have a successful return to campus and also for supporting uh, units to get a sense of uh, the demand for their services. So the answer then to the question is that it's really up to the department. If a department feels most comfortable sort of uh, consolidating answers from multiple uh, departments or multiple units within that department and submitting one large ramp up form, that's fine. Uh, I would encourage uh, departments to th think about one key thing and that is uh, the different sites where they may have employees working. So if a department has, say, 
three different sites on campus where they have employees. It might be useful um, to submit three different forms because oftentimes different sites serve different needs and may have a slightly different setup in terms of how many people are flex working, um, whether or not they may be commuting by public transit or, or driving. And also it helps again uh, with facilities management, for example, and knowing exactly what custodial needs uh, might be required. So one of the other things I just wanted to answer as we're getting um, pretty close to the end here is a couple of folks were, were asking about um, links that we have mentioned. And I have done my best to try and post as many of the links in the chat as possible. And so please do take a look if you have a moment now and do some cutting and pasting perhaps into an email message. Uh, we will uh, be uh, providing uh, these answers also on the covid-19.ucla.edu website. So no worries if you're not able to go in and grab them right now, you will see them later. But this is a great opportunity to, to kind of jump in there in the uh, chat um, and do some uh, cutting and pasting. So I'm going to answer one just uh, right off the bat here. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I can turn back, turn back to you, perhaps, Marisol. Um, the, there are a couple of questions about a set return date um, for staff. Some people are asking specifically about administration, administrative staff. Some are also asking about um, uh, those who serve students directly and sort of customer service roles. Uh, and what, what is the expected return date? So again, I, I don't mean to sound like a broken record, and, uh, but it is up to the department. And some departments are going to find uh, that it's necessary to bring folks back to campus a little earlier than others. Uh, for example, um, housing and hospitality, uh, they will probably be preparing uh, for students uh, to come back into the dorms uh, pretty early. And I know they're almost uh, going at full force right now. Um, but then other departments really don't need to have their folks back on campus until say a week before classes start. Um, in general though, uh, I would just refer back to um, a few months ago when President Drake uh, did make the announcement that we are uh, going to be uh, returning to primarily in-person uh, classes and services at all of our UC campuses uh, for the fall term. So the focus really is on that fall term. And uh, we all know that the fall term starts um, in late September. So whenever uh, your unit needs to be ready, needs to be back in person, at least in part, um, to be able to serve that start of the fall term, uh, that's really the deadline. And again, just encouraging folks to jump back um, into the campus ramp up planning guide and make sure that uh, they, they fill out those ramp up forms as soon as possible. Um, so I think we probably have um, one time for one more question, but of course we are going to uh, put all these back online. Go ahead, Marisol. All right, so our next uh, live question is for Chad. It's an HVAC related question. Who will be responsible for purchasing and changing the air purifier filters installed in general office space? So if the if you're in a room or building that one of the six percent that doesn't meet the minimum HVAC recommendations for COVID, uh, the air purifiers will be purchased. UCLA facilities management will provide the air purifiers. Um, if you're in an area that does meet the HVAC minimum standards set by ASHRAE, the departments can submit an FSR um, to purchase their own air purifiers through facilities management and will be charged. And we will make sure to provide uh, specific instructions then as well on when and how, if there are any filters that need to be replaced, um, how you will do that. 
and instructions uh, for doing so. So thank you everyone uh, to the over 500 people who joined us today and also to the over 500 people uh, who joined us on Monday um, for uh, participating. And again, thank you for all that you do in making sure that we have a successful ramp up at UCLA uh, this fall. So goodbye and have a great rest of the day.